Book Two, Chapter Seven of Michael Strogoff, Courier of the Tsar. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Michael Strogoff by Jules Verne. Book Two, Chapter Seven: The Passage of the Yenisei. At nightfall on the twenty-fifth of August, the Kibitka came in sight of Krasnoyarsk. The journey from Tomsk had taken eight days. If it had not been accomplished as rapidly as it might, it was because Nicholas had slept little. Consequently it was impossible to increase his horse's pace, though in other hands the journey would not have taken sixty hours. Happily there was no longer any fear of Tartars. Not a scout had appeared on the road over which the Kibitka had just travelled. This was strange enough, and evidently some serious cause had prevented the emir's troops from marching without delay upon Irkutsk. Something had occurred. A new Russian corps, hastily raised in the government of Yeniseisk, had marched to Tomsk to endeavor to retake the town, but, being too weak to withstand the emir's troops, now concentrated there, they had been forced to effect a retreat. Feofar Khan, including his own soldiers and those of the Khanates of Kokand and Kunduz, had now under his command two hundred and fifty thousand men, to which the Russian government could not as yet oppose a sufficient force. The invasion could not, therefore, be immediately stopped, and the whole Tartar army might at once march upon Irkutsk. The Battle of Tomsk was on the 22nd of August, though this Michael did not know, but it explained why the vanguard of the emir's army had not appeared at Krasnoyarsk by the 25th. However, though Michael Strogoff could not know the events which had occurred since his departure, he at least knew that he was several days in advance of the Tartars, and that he need not despair of reaching before them the town of Irkutsk, still six hundred miles distant. Besides, at Krasnoyarsk, of which the population is about twelve thousand souls, he depended upon obtaining some means of transport. Since Nicholas Pigasov was to stop in that town, it would be necessary to replace him by a guide, and to change the kibitka for another more rapid vehicle. Michael, after having addressed himself to the governor of the town, and established his identity and quality as courier of the Tsar, which would be easy, doubted not that he would be enabled to get to Irkutsk in the shortest possible time. He would thank the good Nicholas Pigasov, and set out immediately with Nadia, for he did not wish to leave her until he had placed her in her father's arms. Though Nicholas had resolved to stop at Krasnoyarsk, it was only, as he said, on condition of finding employment there. In fact, this model clerk, after having stayed to the last minute at his post in Kolyvan, was endeavouring to place himself again at the disposal of the government. "'Why should I receive a salary which I have not earned?' he would say. In the event of his services not being required at Krasnoyarsk, which it was expected would be still in telegraphic communication with Irkutsk, he proposed to go to Udinsk, or even to the capital of Siberia itself. In the latter case, he would continue to travel with the brother and sister, and where would they find a surer guide or a more devoted friend? The Kibitka was now only half a verst from Krasnoyarsk. The numerous wooden crosses which are erected at the approaches to the town could be seen to the right and left of the road. It was seven in the evening. The outline of the churches and of the houses built on the high bank of the Yenisei were clearly defined against the evening sky, and the waters of the river reflected them in the twilight. "'Where are we, sister?' asked Michael. "'Half a verst from the first houses,' replied Nadia. "'Can the town be asleep?' observed Michael. "'Not a sound strikes my ear. "'And I cannot see the slightest light, nor even smoke mounting into the air,' added Nadia. "'What a queer town!' said Nicholas. "'They make no noise in it, and go to bed uncommonly early.' A presentiment of impending misfortune passed across Michael's heart. He had not said to Nadia that he had placed all his hopes on Krasnoyarsk, where he expected to find the means of safely finishing his journey. He much feared that his anticipations would again be disappointed. But Nadia had guessed his thoughts, although she could not understand why her companion should be so anxious to reach Irkutsk, now that the imperial letter was gone. She one day said something of the sort to him. "'I have sworn to go to Irkutsk,' he replied. 
but to accomplish his mission it was necessary that at krasnoyarsk he should find some more rapid mode of locomotion well friend said he to nicholas why are we not going on because i am afraid of waking up the inhabitants of the town with the noise of my carriage and with a light fleck of the whip nicholas put his horse in motion ten minutes after they entered the high street krasnoyarsk was deserted there was no longer an athenian in this northern athens as madame de bourboulon has called it not one of their dashing equipages swept through the wide clean streets not a pedestrian enlivened the footpaths raised at the bases of the magnificent wooden houses of monumental aspect not a siberian bell dressed in the last french fashion promenaded the beautiful park cleared in a forest of birch trees which stretches away to the banks of the yenisei the great bell of the cathedral was dumb the chimes of the churches were silent here was complete desolation there was no longer a living being in this town lately so lively the last telegram sent from the Tsar's cabinet, before the rupture of the wire, had ordered the governor, the garrison, the inhabitants, whoever they might be, to leave Krasnoyarsk, to carry with them any articles of value, of which might be of use to the Tartars, and to take refuge at Irkutsk. The same injunction was given to all the villages of the province. It was the intention of the Muscovite government to lay the country desert before the invaders no one thought for an instant of disputing these orders they were executed and this was the reason why not a single human being remained in krasnoyarsk michael strogoff nadia and nicholas passed silently through the streets of the town they felt half stupefied they themselves made the only sound to be heard in this dead city michael allowed nothing of what he felt to appear but he inwardly raged against the bad luck which pursued him his hopes being again disappointed alack alack cried nicholas i shall never get any employment in this desert friend said nadia you must go on with us i must indeed replied nicholas the wire is no doubt still working between udinsk and irkutsk and there shall we start little father let us wait till to-morrow answered michael you are right said nicholas we have the yenisei to cross and need light to see our way there to see murmured nadia thinking of her blind companion nicholas heard her and turning to michael forgive me little father said he alas night and day it is true are all the same to you do not reproach yourself friend replied michael pressing his hand over his eyes with you for a guide i can still act take a few hours repose nadia must rest too to-morrow we will recommence our journey michael and his friends had not to search long for a place of rest the first house the door of which they pushed open was empty as well as all the others nothing could be found within but a few heaps of leaves for want of better fodder the horse had to content himself with this scanty nourishment the provisions of the kibitka were not yet exhausted so each had a share then after having knelt before a small picture of the penagia hung on the wall and still lighted up by a flickering lamp nicholas and the young girl slept whilst michael over whom sleep had no influence watched before daybreak the next morning the twenty sixth of august the horse was drawing the kibitka through the forests of birch trees towards the banks of the yenisei michael was in much anxiety how was he to cross the river if as was probable all boats had been destroyed to retard the tartars march he knew the yenisei its width was considerable its currents strong ordinarily by means of boats specially built for the conveyance of travellers carriages and horses the passage of the yenisei takes about three hours and then it is with extreme difficulty that the boats reach the opposite bank now in the absence of any ferry how was the kibitka to get from one bank to the other day was breaking when the kibitka reached the left bank where one of the wide alleys of the park ended they were about a hundred feet above the yenisei and could therefore survey the whole of its wide course do you see a boat asked michael casting his eyes eagerly about from one side to the other mechanically no doubt as if he could really see it is scarcely light yet brother replied nadia the fog is still thick and we cannot see the water but i hear it roaring said michael indeed from the fog issued a dull roaring sound the waters being high rushed down with tumultuous violence 
all three waited until the misty curtain should rise the sun would not be long in dispersing the vapors well asked michael the fog is beginning to roll away brother replied nadia and it will soon be clear then you do not see the surface of the water yet not yet have patience little father said nicholas all this will soon disappear look here comes the breeze it is driving away the fog the trees on the opposite hills are already appearing it is sweeping flying away the kindly rays of the sun have condensed all that mass of mist ah how beautiful it is my poor fellow and how unfortunate that you cannot see such a lovely sight do you see a boat asked michael i see nothing of the sort answered nicholas look well friend on this and the opposite bank as far as your eye can reach a raft even a canoe nicholas and nadia grasping the bushes on the edge of the cliff bent over the water the view they thus obtained was extensive at this place the yenisei is not less than a mile in width and forms two arms of unequal size through which the waters flow swiftly between these arms lie several islands covered with alders willows and poplars looking like verdant ships anchored in the river beyond rise the high hills of the eastern shore crowned with forests whose tops were then empurpled with light the yenisei stretched on either side as far as the eye could reach the beautiful panorama lay before them for a distance of fifty versts but not a boat was to be seen all had been taken away or destroyed according to order unless the tartars should bring with them materials for building a bridge of boats their march towards irkutsk would certainly be stopped for some time by this barrier the yenisei i remember said michael that higher up on the outskirts of krasnoyarsk there is a little quay there the boats touch friend let us go up the river and see if some boat has not been forgotten on the bank nadia seized michael's hand and started off at a rapid pace in the direction indicated if only a boat or a barge large enough to hold the kibitka could be found or even one that would carry just themselves michael would not hesitate to attempt the passage twenty minutes after all three had reached the little quay with houses on each side quite down to the water's edge it was like a village standing beyond the town of krasnoyarsk but not a boat was on the shore not a barge at the little wharf nothing even of which a raft could be made large enough to carry three people michael questioned nicholas who made the discouraging reply that the crossing appeared to him absolutely impracticable we shall cross answered michael the search was continued they examined the houses on the shore abandoned like all the rest of krasnoyarsk they had merely to push open the doors and enter the cottages were evidently those of poor people and quite empty nicholas visited one nadia entered another and even michael went here and there and felt about hoping to light upon some article that might be useful nicholas and the girl had each fruitlessly rummaged these cottages and were about to give up the search when they heard themselves called both ran to the bank and saw michael standing on the threshold of a door come he exclaimed nicholas and nadia went towards him and followed him into the cottage what are these asked michael touching several objects piled up in a corner they are leathern bottles answered nicholas are they full yes full of kumis we have found them very opportunely to renew our provisions kumis is a drink made of mare's or camel's milk and is very sustaining and even intoxicating so that nicholas and his companions could not but congratulate themselves on the discovery save one said michael but empty the others directly little father these will help us to cross the yenisei and the raft will be the kibitka itself which is light enough to float besides we will sustain it as well as the horse with these bottles well thought of little father exclaimed nicholas and by god's help we will get safely over though perhaps not in a straight line for the current is very rapid what does that matter replied michael let us get across first and we shall soon find out the road to irkutsk on the other side of the river to work then said nicholas beginning to empty the bottles one full of kumis was reserved and the rest with the air carefully fastened in were used to form a floating apparatus two bottles were fastened to the horse's sides to support it in the water 
two others were attached to the shafts to keep them on a level with the body of the machine thus transformed into a raft this work was soon finished you will not be afraid nadia asked michael no brother answered the girl and you friend i cried nicholas i am now going to have one of my dreams realized that of sailing in a cart at the spot where they were now standing the bank sloped and was suitable for the launching of the kibitka the horse drew it into the water and they were soon both floating as to serko he was swimming bravely the three passengers seated in the vehicle had with due precaution taken off their shoes and stockings but thanks to the bottles the water did not even come over their ankles michael held the reins and according to nicholas's directions guided the animal obliquely but cautiously so as not to exhaust him by struggling against the current so long as the kibitka went with the current all was easy and in a few minutes it had passed the quays of krasnoyarsk it drifted northwards and it was soon evident that it would only reach the opposite bank far below the town but that mattered little the crossing would have been made without great difficulty even on this imperfect apparatus had the current been regular but unfortunately there were whirlpools in numbers and soon the kibitka notwithstanding all michael's efforts was irresistibly drawn into one of these there the danger was great the kibitka no longer drifted but spun rapidly round inclining towards the centre of the eddy like a rider in a circus the horse could scarcely keep his head above water and ran a great risk of being suffocated serko had been obliged to take refuge in the carriage michael knew what was happening he felt himself drawn round in a gradually narrowing line from which they could not get free how he longed to see to be better able to avoid this peril but that was no longer possible nadia was silent her hands clinging to the sides of the cart which was inclining more and more towards the centre of depression and nicholas did he not understand the gravity of the situation was it with him phlegm or contempt of danger courage or indifference was his life valueless in his eyes and according to the eastern expression an hotel for five days which whether one is willing or not must be left the sixth at any rate the smile on his rosy face never faded for an instant the kibitka was thus in the whirlpool and the horse was nearly exhausted when all at once michael throwing off such of his garments as might impede him jumped into the water then seizing with a strong hand the bridle of the terrified horse he gave him such an impulse that he managed to struggle out of the circle and getting again into the current the kibitka drifted along anew hurrah exclaimed nicholas two hours after leaving the wharf the kibitka had crossed the widest arm of the river and had landed on an island more than six versts below the starting point there the horse drew the cart on to the bank and an hour's rest was given to this courageous animal then the island having been crossed under the shade of its magnificent birches the kibitka found itself on the shore of the smaller arm of the yenisei this passage was much easier no whirlpools broke the course of the river in this second bed but the current was so rapid that the kibitka only reached the opposite side five versts below they had drifted eleven versts in all these great siberian rivers across which no bridges have as yet been thrown are serious obstacles to the facility of communication all had been more or less unfortunate to michael strogoff on the irtych the boat which carried him and nadia had been attacked by tartars on the obi after his horse had been struck by a bullet he had only by a miracle escaped from the horsemen who were pursuing him in fact this passage of the yenisei had been performed the least disastrously that would not have been so amusing exclaimed nicholas rubbing his hands as they disembarked on the right bank of the river if it had not been so difficult that which has only been difficult to us friend answered michael strogoff will perhaps be impossible to the tartars end of book two chapter seven